My name is Lord Hanfra Spencer, I'm the Chairman of the Ministry of Sound uh, and I'm uh, the Chairman of this panel and we are joined today by, uh, from left to right, uh, and they'll all introduce themselves to you and give you their respective planning related anecdotes and advice shortly. Naomi, Naomi Miller, who's from Union Chapel, um, Helen McGee, uh, who's from Academy Music Group, um, Richard uh, Keating and Rich, what, what, what are you from? from Orms Architects. Orms Architects, uh, who are working on the Denmark Street development, and uh, Shane Shapiro, who, Dr. Shane Shapiro, you, uh, um, who works on Music City and has worked closely with uh, the GLA on uh, the Night Art position and uh, on London Entertainment Policy. Um, so, uh, before we kick off, if you've got the app, have you got the app? Please download the app and uh, tweet or whatever it is, your updates uh, using the three dot symbol in the top right hand corner with each program screen. For Android, the comment prompt is on the right hand of each program screen. Please make nice comments about us because it's helpful for the organisers uh, to get feedback about what's going on in these panels. Um, so, I, I thought I'd give a brief intro uh, on uh, my experience, our experience at Ministry of Sound, because we had quite a high profile planning dispute that went on for a good four or five years, uh, a number of years ago, and actually still continues. Uh, and I didn't know anything about the planning process until I found myself in the middle of it. Uh, until I found myself in the middle of it. We uh, received a planning application that was addressed to the occupier uh, on our uh, reception uh, in 2009. And when we looked at it, it was for a 41-storey block of residential apartments housing 1,000 people uh, 10 metres from our front gate and our queue where, I mean, we are a 1,500 capacity venue and across the nights, the Friday and Saturday nights, we have up to 5,000 people coming through our club, uh, arriving at about 10.30 in the evening and leaving up to 9 a.m. the next morning. So not a particularly hospitable environment to have residential apartments like the directly opposite. I approached the developer and planning department and said that I was terribly concerned about the impact that this was going to have. Um, and I was told, look, I can't hope to stand in the way of regeneration and that nightclubs come and go. Uh, now, at that point, and we've now been in Elephant Trust for 25 years, uh, we've been there for the, you know, nearly, 20 years, or nearly 20 years, and it, it just seemed like a very dismissive approach to a venue that not only entertained hundreds of thousands of people every year, uh, but also was the home to a big uh, international entertainment business that included a record company and an events business and merchandise and all of those sorts of stuff, and, and we employed nearly 200 people. Out of elephant, and this was the beating heart of what we did. So um, we uh, started to work on an objection to that planning application, uh, which was a very complicated process and involved uh, not only technical work with uh, acoustics experts, my acoustic experts are very kindly joined us in the room here, so if anyone needs acoustics advice, please speak to Kieran afterwards. Um, but also planning consultants and uh, legal representatives and political lobbyists. And we got drawn into a very long process and a very expensive process which lasted two years before that application was rejected. Uh, um, and we thought we'd won. Uh, at which point then uh, it was called in by the mayor, um, who's now the foreign secretary, uh, who then reviewed that application over a following two year period. And just before the end, I was told in no uncertain terms that we were going to lose and that this was going to go through. And the best thing for us to do was to work on a compromise solution with the developers, and with the uh, GLA, and with the local planning authority that allowed them to build their flats but gave us the protection that we need. So we worked needed. So we put that to them and said that we believed there was a solution and then Boris sent us away um, with a flea in our respective ears and told us, you go and deliver that and I'll support it. At which point we were able to put the developer in a situation where they granted us something called a deed of easement, which allowed us to, well firstly, they um, 
they were forced to have sealed windows on their development uh, with extra thick acoustic glazing. Uh, but the deed of easement allowed us to operate at a certain acoustic level, uh, which were the levels that we were currently operating at. We, we, we ran plenty of noise tests to demonstrate that was the case. Uh, provided we didn't drop, uh, we didn't go above those levels, uh, there was nothing that anyone who bought one of those flats or rented one of those flats could do to object to us. But as we found out at the beginning, there's no protection for a venue, even if you're there first, if someone comes along uh, as a resident makes a complaint. And unfortunately, again, because the people who receive those complaints who sit on committees, on licensing committees, are councillors, they, they care more about the complaints that come from local residents <coughs> who vote than they do from local businesses who don't. So uh, the, the deed of easement is something that we've uh, tried to draw into the principle of agent of change. And we've heard agent of change mentioned in the opening speech this morning. Agent of change is not enshrined in planning policy anywhere. It's just a discussion point at the moment. Um, it is something that we like uh, instituted, particularly in London. Um, but it's not happened yet, and there's no sign of it happening anytime soon. Um, but I'm certainly going to be writing to uh, the Minister Concerned uh, and encouraging them to re-look at this issue. Uh, but an easement was the way forward for us. Uh, but other people around on this panel have got other stories, and I'm going to pass on to them, and they'll tell you their respective stories, and we can then perhaps open the floor up to some questions from you and, and discuss some of the issues that you may have had in your respective venues. And one more next. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I uh, work for Casual Music Group and we've got 18 venues across the UK. I look after eight of them in the south. I'd say probably every single one of them in the past couple of years has had some sort of development going on around it which has brought its own nightmares. Um, my top tip for you guys is to get ahead of the game and make sure you register on your local planning portals so the moment the planning application is made, you get the, get the tip off. Before you get to that point, make sure you know your neighbours, you're friends with them, they know they can come and talk to you so that you can all join together against the developers because without fail, the moment you get off of that to shoot at halls or whatever, the nature of the area changes and it'll get local on you guys because you will be the ones creating a noise, creating a hassle. Um, the most of the problems we have probably are less to do with acoustics from the venues and more to do with smoking areas, loadings and that side of things. Um, we sort of found there's three different levels you go through. So there's first of all there's the planning application and making sure that you can fight that. Then there's the actual development where the builders will do what they like, when they like, ride roughshod over you, take over your parking, prevent you from loading it, prevent you from deliveries, just cause you loads and loads of hassle. So you just need to be awkward and absolutely on it at every point of that. Use um, the considerate contractors organisation to complain to them if you've got any problems with that. And then finally, um, you've got your nice new shiny building which will bring with it its own challenges. Um, we've had one venue go for a licence review recently. Just one resident went through the four licensing objectives and that's a licence review. £10,000 worth of legal fees later, We've still got our licence, nothing fundamentally changed because we were lucky that the councillors, the police and licensing acknowledged the venue was incredibly well managed with a consistent management team. But we've still got a 10 grand bill to put up with and we know because of the local publicity of a load of residents who think anything that happens in a five mile radius is our fault. So um, yeah, those are the challenges for us. Yeah, very similar to Helen in that. Um, we recently got a new block of flats just about to finish building. They're um, finishing off the decoration at the minute. And a row of houses, which um, some of it's social housing, the rest are £99,000 do bed flats. Which, um, and when the planning stage went through, they weren't necessarily told they were moving into a music venue because we're a church and they wouldn't necessarily think that would be going on. Um, we're also a homeless shelter and at the time we had a Sunday drop-in, um, effectively a soup kitchen, where um, people um, with housing crisis would queue up outside. We had potential buyers come by and ask if 
this would cause many problems because the developers haven't told them. Um, one thing which I agree with in Helen is getting your current neighbours on side because our current neighbours, um, they're just great supporters, they've lived on the, the same terrace for for years and um, you know, recently we had some vandalism when our, the windows of the chapel got smashed and the neighbours on the terrace put together and paid for the um, paid for them to get uh, an air fixed. Um, what the developers don't seem to realise is, it, you know, we're a community, community centre but there's also a lot of sort of daytime activities during the building with the drilling and the constant hammering. We lost a lot of um, daytime hire because they're a rehearsal venue and we haven't had repeat business from quite a few clients because of it. Um, so that's, I think, is what you need to be doing, telling developers if, if you do have any um, you know, income concerns, that you've lost of income due to the actual building work that goes on. Um, and yeah, I agree with Helen on everything. Touch wood, we've not had any complaints yet from the new neighbours, but they're not all moved in yet. And we're getting into the busy sort of season now. So we've got about 60 gigs left in the year. And hopefully the load ins and fans waiting outside. And yeah, that's going to cause some problems for people who live 10 yards away. So yeah. It's safe, it's safe to say that not, not all developers are evil, although um, everybody has their own respective agendas and, and I think they look on these venues as being um, uh, the antichrist. Uh, and, and so whether you're trying to be good neighbours uh, with the people who are moving into these developments or with the developers when they, they turn up, it's sort of critical if you could be cooperative in working with them. Uh, then hopefully there are ways of achieving uh, you know, mutually acceptable solutions. But you know, we are uh, designed to be next to residential builds. But in the case of Denmark Street, see what I've done. Uh, there's a, there, there is a reasonably positive example of developers working with the local community to mitigate about the changing nature of an area. Can I pass you the mic now? Almost ready. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Richard, I'm an architect, so I, um, I need to have pretty pictures with me to, to talk, that's what we do. Um, we heard a lot this morning, mentioned a couple of times, of, about ripping the heart out of Denmark Street and um, that the Astoria will, will not be replaced and what I'm here to talk about this afternoon is to give you that, the good news that we're actually putting two new music venues back into, the, into central London, into the, right into the heart of Camden. We are working for a developer but the, the purpose of the whole scheme is about music and keeping music in, in that area. So we're lo located in St Giles, it sits between Fitzrovia, Covent Garden, Soho um, it is just on the border between Westminster and, and Camden. Um, it's central London, it's the end of Oxford Street, it's the bottom of Tottenham Court Road for, for people that, that know that part of London well. It's, a, it's called St Giles Circus, it's a historical site because it was originally a circus and that was important in us getting planning permission for, for this scheme. We were replacing with a quality building what was a, a historically curved circus building as you can see in the, in the centre there. Come the, the 70s when Centrepoint arrived, that crashed through the middle of that, that circus. And you, if you know that part of town, you'll remember there were advertising hoardings there, there for years, a sort of cragged end, end of the building. So we're, we're making good that fabric now, putting back a building of which within that there's a basement music venue and a grassroots music venue. So Denmark Street itself, known as Timpan Alley, has got a fantastic history. Into war, it was a music publishing area. Um, Post-war, it then started to have the recording studios come in, it had the music shops come in, and people like Rolling Stones recorded their first album, number four, Beatles signed their, their first record there. Elton John wrote his first single on the roof. So it's got an amazing history, and a lot of those spaces, 
Sex Pistols studio, as an example, has just been listed and, and been protected. Um, the 12 bar is a, a, mu is a music venue that uh, was moved to Holloway, um, and that's one of the music venues that we're replacing with this, with this new scheme. So there's a number of listed buildings along the street, along Denmark Street. We're keeping all of those. The retailers that are in there, um, we're keeping all of those. Excuse if you read the month of the 12 bars here, actually, so you can... Um, right. You can verify whether that's true or not. Not knowing Holloway anymore. No, the 12 bar aren't going back in. There's a music venue going back in in the location of the old 12 bar. Yeah, there's been no plans or anything. But that's surely architects. That's not your decision, though, is it? That's down to the. Uh, yeah, when I can confirm that there is that, that there is a music venue space that will be in the exact same location. There's, as the there's, 12 an, 800 bar. Capacity. Okay. there's an 800 capacity venue going. 18 people, whatever, underground. No, it's I'll, I'll talk to you about the, the two music venues in a second. I don't think Mark's been consulted with Mark Hill. Sure. If you let me run through it, I'll let, I'll let you know what we're up to. So there's, if, if you read Evening Standard, you'll hear that all of the, the retailers are moving out and they're, they're not welcome back. Actually, they're staying in throughout the whole development. So one of those are there at the moment. They have, they have three shops. They're staying in. Mark ran the whole, the whole venue, sort of coordinated all of them, so he went yeah. there. I don't think that's what's actually No, that's happened. great. The, but the, um, the retailers themselves, yes, they're moving up and down the street while the works go on, but no, no music retailers are, are leaving the site. They're all there, all there at the moment as, as we speak, um, and the work is just starting on site. So the, to get a planning commission for a new music venue needed to start from the outset. Why was a music venue needed in that place? So we, we looked at the existing London venues um, around the area, the capacity, what was needed, um, which ones are closed? Of course, the Astoria, just opposite our site, was closed as a Derwent London site. Um, they're not putting a new music venue back in their, in their development, um, but we are in the, in the development we're doing. And all of this was instigated by Crossrail. So you know, the reason that we were able to demolish some of those buildings in the first place, Crossrail demolished those to put that um, put our tunnels in. We are building over the top of Crossrail um, and of course that has hundreds of thousands of people coming out every day and that, that was a generator for this scheme. So a generator for music venues but also for the urban gallery which I'll talk to you about in a minute which is part of the way the, the music venues were, were funded. So a series of listed buildings that we're keeping and the brief was to create this global icon for London. So it's a mix between retail, music, restaurants, office, hotel, residential, and, all, and that's all, all mixed together um, on, that, on that one side. There's a St. Giles Church, which is at the back of the site. If you, again, part of winning this planning application is important to preserve those listed buildings and also preserve the views through to St. Giles Church. So we're creating two new buildings, which are right in front of Crossroad. Um, building A, building B, the smaller building allows you the views across to St. Giles Church and creating this plaza, this public plaza in front of the, front of the building um, which is part of our, our McCanter site as well, the base, base of centre point. So there's a new public square there. Again, to win a planning application, the consultation, you know, if, if you're putting a mission in for a new one, don't underestimate the amount of consultation and the time it takes to do that. So, this was a couple of years in the process of meeting everyone from Camden, councillors, Seven Dials Trust, Bloomsbury Association. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so this is what the building looks like, and the music venue sits underneath <coughs> this building. So the main entrance. Can I just ask why are you saying you put your twelve bar back in when it's just not true? No, we're not putting twelve bar back in. We're putting a music venue back in where twelve bar was previously. Okay, I, was, I maybe slipped my words, but well, you did. You we're putting. Words and you said you put the back. The truth is, they were treated absolutely despicably. You know, horrifically treated by the developers. That's the truth. And I, I think that's a, a that's a common occurrence. It's not generally the fault of the architect. No, but so let's paint the picture. You know, no, in here and presenting that that's how it was. It's not yeah. how it was. No, a, absolutely, absolutely. You know, they were told they're going to get another venue. They were told not to tell the media because then they wouldn't get a new venue, and then they weren't given a venue anyway. And they've been shoved out, that's the truth of it. And, and they did do a pop up in Holloway, but only for a few months. Yeah, you know, yeah. So no, I saw it. And, and, it, and, it, and it didn't work because of its location. 
it didn't work because of its location, but yeah. it was situated on Denmark Street and it was very successful there. So we yeah. just want to get it in there for the record that you're painting a very rosy picture. It's not actually the truth. Okay. So the music, but the Lauren asked me to show the music venue. So the, the first one, the larger one, starts off as an 800 person venue and will become a 2,000 person venue in a year's time after it opens. And that's underground here, so it's... Who can we run it this? It's still out for debate at the moment. Well, what's, uh, what's I hope that's interested in it. Well. It's not confirmed. How much it's is it to Are people, people pitching for this? Yeah, people are pitching for that. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a good material point. What's the range of the square yeah. for it? What do they anticipate that being? Well, it's, it's a question probably. For yeah, the it's for the developer. For another richer developer. <laughs> because yeah. it's mixed across the whole site. It depends how much, the, whether it's a music venue or to take some office space. I think, I think the point is, and uh, if you don't mind me um, uh, uh, contributing a bit, I think we're seeing this around Elephant and Castle because there's a lot more development going around. And what developers are now doing to try and satiate complaints from existing venues is saying, oh, yeah, and, and here's a music venue that we're building into our development. And you ask a, bit, a few more questions about it. And it, it's a, a two or 300 capacity music venue come theatre, come cinema, come bar or jazz club or whatever, um, as, as a, amorphous a space as they can. They are uh, as equally unclear on rental costs and, and rentable value uh, as this situation is and so in order to get through planners they're saying okay well we'll put some sort of music space in there so it ticks a box but they don't find the people to operate it and you know we look when at it work out, then they the and when they do, when it doesn't work out work out they put an application to change it and turn it into a car park or something like that so it's and it, it's it's very does, difficult does that flex do you not need to have that flexibility in a space that it can be multi-use, it can be used. Yeah, but I think I think I think the weekend. You need affordable rent to music venues, and I don't think that's been factored. I doubt it's factored in. There is a section one hundred six on Denmark. Yeah, but section one hundred sixes can be, you know, I know they can be. I know I'm supposed to be an independent chair, but they get changed. They get changed, and planning applications get varied, and they get they get very. I mean, Helen, you talked about a situation when we were sitting here beforehand about not only planning applications get varied, new planning applications get put in around the back door to try and yeah. circumvent variation of planning applications. Yeah, I mean, the reason I say you have to make sure that you're keeping an eye on everything. So we had one venue, uh, planning application went in. Every objective music venue just was fantastic. It helps you subject the residents all got board Objection went in. They put in an amended planning application, and then on the same day put a completely fresh planning application in, which was worse than the first one. And the only reason we spotted it because all the signs that go up look the same is because I had a series of emails that came in with slightly different reference numbers. And if we'd not picked up on that final application and put in our objections, we'd have ended up with the worst application than the first one. The point is, these people know the system much better than you do and they've got more money than you have and so the only way you're Shane I'm sure you're going to jump sorry Rich but the, no, the, the, really the, the, only, the only way you're important one there is a legal agreement that's, that's, that's in there yeah but they get varied they get varied you know, what, what can you do other than get that legal agreement in the first place that says there has to be a music venue well, but, it has but, to operate for a certain number of hours yeah, but, uh, well, maybe that's a good point for you to, to no, jump no. in I want to try to be optimistic. Is that possible? <laughs> like, I understand. Like, I completely understand where you're coming from. Of all people, I get it. Um, first off, all, as we said earlier, I'm, my name is Shane Shapiro. I run a company called Sound Diplomacy. We work around the world with governments and cities and property developers on music strategies. And a lot of it's just talking to people. And one thing that we've realized is there is no communication between any of these sides. And I think that in London, really, the earliest discussions around this were around, your, around the Ministry of Sound Issues in 2009, which is seven years ago, which is not a long time when it comes to legal and planning things. And well, I'll, I'll talk about um, very, very briefly. So we have a contract with the GLA, and I'm there between three and five days a week nowadays and I work with um, the culture team and in the manifesto of the new mayor culture is uh, one of the four main pillars so that's housing transport 
um, health or environment, I should know this, and culture. That's the first time that's ever happened, and that means that, that, means that you have a lot more responsibility, and there's a whole bunch of things in the manifesto which uh, the mayor wants to deliver, and uh, I know the deputy mayor said a few of these things, but going back, uh, the, not only are the laws, the law and the governance around protecting and supporting music venues and nightclubs completely not fit for purpose. No one really even realized that until a few years ago. And in order to not only change local law and local, um, well, local law and local governance and SPGs, what are called supplementary planning guidance, which are just guidance, so they don't mean law, but also changing national law, is you first have to recognize that there's a problem. And we think that we've at least done that. Okay, so we, uh, Mark David and Paul Broadhurst, who's the head of music for the GLA, who's somewhere around here, and myself uh, and a number of other people wrote the rescue plan for grassroots music venues, and we had seven recommendations in that plan. One of them was create a nightmare. It got changed to Night Czar, <laughs> but because uh, even though we found an Elm Street to launch it on, and um, and then there are a number. And then as we've been as we've been working on our plans, and agent of change is one of them. Agent of change means nothing unless it's comprehensive. Um, there are a number of other finicky planning and licensing things that have to be sorted out. It takes a long time, but we have been committed now to changing the London plan to protecting music venues, uh, artist studios, nightclubs, a number of other things, much more. The, the London plan comes in in 2019. So what we've seen, especially in the last six months, is a whole bunch of horrible situations um, that are affecting jobs and people's livelihoods and people I genuinely care about, like Passing Clouds and Fabric and Silver Bullet and a number of other things. And I think that my belief is all these really horrible situations that I wish I could sort all of them out, but I can't, um, are clouding the fact that the macro is getting better. And whether you believe me or not, the mindset is changing. We are committed to trying to working on it, but I, I come at it thinking, yes, we have a great, we do have a commitment to do two new music venues on Denmark Street. How they operate is another conversation, but we're not there yet. We just, in the last few months, made sure that the venues are going to happen and secured the capacity for them. Um, and there's a number of other uh, music venue projects. And the only positive that I can see is uh, we're having developers come to us now wanting to build music venues. I've had three in the last month. Yes, that comes with its many issues, uh, but that's better than, I remember last year I emailed a developer and they told me to fuck off. Like, we don't want a music venue. But now, there's one just, uh, there's one just by City Hall that's being talked about. Um, I think that's a positive, you know? So I'm trying to be positive about it. So instead of constantly criticizing and saying, oh, if it doesn't happen my way, then it's not gonna happen, and this constant us versus them, developers, want to work with us. I did a music conference with developers on the 6th of September. We had 40 developers in the room talking about music. It's called sound development. We have to work together in a pragmatic way or we're not going to accomplish anything. And I do believe that Denmark Street has its significant issues, but the fact that it's happening is better than it not happening. And we all have to come together and say, listen, let's try to work with all parties. And that's what we try to do and that's what I try to do. And and I'm trying to be an eternal optimist, but I know I'll fuck up a lot, so but I apologize. So can, can, can the GLA um, impo uh, in, in, ensure that the 106 on Denmark Street is not varied to change the use of these venues as they've been designed, and to force them to offer concessionary rents so that operators uh, of music venues can afford to work in there, and to give them you know, uh, uh, rate cuts so that they can afford to operate in there. Because as far as the 12 bar was concerned, it was a tiny venue. I mean, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, it was a tiny venue, and I guess you were barely washing your face in terms of the revenues that you were generating versus what your costs were. To go into an 800 capacity underground music venue. Well, uh, it's, it's 250 capacity. Okay, well, 200, even the 250 capacity venue. Now, the economics around that, you know, we have the benefit of having a, a, a 1,500 capacity nightclub and we're only open two nights a week, but we have our punters in for 12 hours a time. So they drink rather a lot. If they're coming along to see a band for a couple of hours, 
you know, it's very difficult to make the economics of yeah. that make sense. If yes, in terms of the future, in terms of re, re in, in, the, in the mayor's powers, as I know, and again, I'm a consultant, I don't sit there every day, but I'm learning very, very quickly. Within the mayor's powers, um, all local plans have to abide by the London plan. And the London plan does not mention music venues right now. It mentions culture, I think, three times in a very general sense. And the London plan is written every eight years. Um, so by having specific reference to things and then defining in planning terms how those references work. For example, there's no, there's no use class for music venues. Do you guys know that? In planning terms, there's no use class for grassroots music venue. They fall under three or four different classes. Um, A3, D2, A4, sui generis. What that means is they're complicated from a planner's mindset to operate in, right? So we're essentially saying do something, but from a planner's mind, they don't even know how to work with it because it's not within a specific use class. That we can change. We can create more defined guidance. We can be a lot more idiot proof around all of this. But this was never done before because no one realized that there was such a problem, I believe, up until 2009. Um, and, and none of us are planners. I'm not a planner. Paul Broadhurst that the GLA is not a planner. Thankfully, we do have a planner at the GLA who loves music, <laughs> um, who works with us. His name's Andrew Russell. But we had to realize what the problems were. And I think that's one of the things that I always try to grapple with. Because I, I ran a music venue when I was 18, 19 in Canada before I moved over here. And we had all sorts of problems, different problems, but all sorts of problems. And then I've been a bit detached from it because I've worked in other sections of the industry and now coming back into it sometimes I miss I underestimate the emotional side of it but in my head all I can do is think well what are the tangible policy problems that we can solve we can the London plan can be more supportive of music venues there can be much more guidance the licensing system is a mess but the mayor of London does not have any jurisdiction over licensing that's a national issue and hopefully Lord Clement Jones can uh, can push forward that cultural um, category for licensing, that would be game changing. Because right now, everything, licensing only covers bad things and it should support. Like, you know, uh, that's, that's what we're trying to work on, but it doesn't change the issues on the ground right now. Richard. I, I didn't say a 12 bars going back in. There's a new music venue going in okay, underneath well, where the 12, 12 bar was. It's okay, a 250 well, person the the grassroots music venue. Grassroots music venue. What grassroots music venue? Because the thing is, can I explain what a grassroots music venue is to you? A grassroots music venue has roots, right? And so if you talk about a grassroots music venue, what grassroots music venue are you going to pick up from where and put into a shiny stainless steel basement because there was one right there and the roots were ripped out of it and it's been chucked away and what are you going to put in there? So all this rhetoric about grassroots music venue, do you know what a grassroots music venue is? Because Mark here was running it for 15 years and he'd established 15 years worth of roots in that community with all of those people coming there and they haven't even been consulted and the way that they were treated was that they were told that if they didn't say anything to the press they would get a new music venue and that was a lie. You know, that's what we see again and again. I'm not blaming you, but I just want to set for the record straight because what is missing out of this is, yes, there's all these plans, but the thing is that music venues take years to develop. They're very subtle, organic creatures that take a lot of... I'm sure you know at a personal level, you understand that. But what's happening here is they're just getting ripped out and then a basement built and then a grassroots music venue is getting... But, you know, where's, where's the consideration? for the grassroots music venue that was there. Where's the level of communication with them? Where's the care? Where's the, the consideration about the jobs and the community that held that venue together and they've all lost their jobs, they've all got to go elsewhere, bringing that back. Do you know what I mean? And that's what I'm just saying is, I'm sure you're aware of this shit. I, th I like, think that that, I, I know, I, I'm all, I completely agree. The mindset that, you know, it's just <laughs> There's two. You use the rhetoric but we're putting a grassroots music venue back in there, when one just got ripped out. I mean, it's just, sorry, but it's just, but our choice is our choice is no venue or a venue, and we decide collectively what how we to, okay, how we can do with it. Developers, if that's your 
Yeah, yeah, no, no. no I, I, let's, 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 let's take some. No, I, I think, you know, I, I absolutely, because I've been through this, I completely sympathise with your position here. And I don't think it's fair to put it on the architect because they're doing a job and they're commissioned by the developers to do that. Uh, he's, not a he's not a representative of the developers. He works for the architectural firm that has been hired by the developers. That's a different thing. So, uh, and I do appreciate the difficult situation that Richard's in, but I'm, I am totally uh, sympathetic, as I think most of the people in the room are, with everything that you're saying, because this is happening all the time. And a shiny uh, uh, concrete basement does not represent a grassroots music venue, and there is no communication because although the developers, I'm afraid, Shane, turn up to your conference because they've been told that they need to tick a music venue box. I, I, know, I know, I know. And that's why they're there. And so if they can be seen to do it, that's another box tick. The developers are concerned about building things and making money. You know, and they will tell you that they're moving society forward and they're helping re regeneration and they're building communities, but they are uh, private, financially motivated businesses, as are, to an extent, we all are, but we have, um, you know, we, we have a, a cultural uh, a, a, a commitment to I mean, what we're doing. There are different well. types of developers. There are different types uh, of developers. Know, it's, a, it's a complicated yeah, ecosystem. It's great, it's great. We can we can, we can try, but if you we we should try to work towards that. And the more, but it is from our for this panel for this room of people, the best thing that we can advise you to do is to not assume that any of those developers or any of those planners are going to do anything more than they're currently doing. And it is up to you guys to stay on your toes and unfortunately to educate yourself in the planning system because they will try and circumvent any obligations that they've got to you other than anything that is um, strictly Look, legal. You asked like what are the things that you could do, right? Like what are the things that you could do? That, that's what you asked in pragmatic or literal things that people yeah. can do to work on this. The first thing that we always say, which was said, the first thing is vote in local elections. No one votes in local elections. And this whole local councillors listen to people who vote for them. God, that's true. I promise. Um, two is getting to know your ward councillor. Uh, I'm sorry, like you getting to know and making friends with the ward councillor if they fight your back. Very helpful. That can be really, really helpful. Um, none of us are planning experts. God, I'm certainly not, or licensing experts. But try to if well, you're interested our, in our this. ward councillor who stood up for yeah. us on our planning committee and was the only one who did. Uh, ironically ended up becoming our local MP, um, which has been, you know, continually helpful for us. Uh, but going and talking to your councillors makes a big difference. Can I, uh, there, there's, I've seen some hands go up, can we, we take some questions from the audience now? Does anyone want to come grab a mic? So just to clarify, um, has any music venue operators been consulted at all on the plans for the music? venue in the basement? Yes, they have. So who, who are they? So Music Venue Trust, as an example, were involved... Is this microphone on? Yeah. Were involved in the, in the process. Um, PRS were involved um, in a pre-planning application. So we, we took advice from you know, people in the, in the, in the industry. Um, COCO were part of the process as well before we went into planning. Just to make sure we got the brief right and what we were what we were delivering was suitable for you know a music venue of that size. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Other questions, please. Can you pass the microphone along. You'd have a lot of questions. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to broaden out a bit, Shane. Actually, it's a Monica from the Stables and Milton Keynes. We're about to have four thousand houses built round about us, and. Uh, We've just gone through probably four or five years worth of trying to fight planning and make the case and get do exactly what you've said. When we actually got to the planning hearing, um, and our chair did the objection to the to the plans, um, the uh, council officers making the decision were told in no uncertain terms by the legal advisor that they had to disregard our comments because they were at risk of failing to meet their housing target and that actually had to take precedence over everything else. So to my mind, that's one of the things that needs sorting out and addressing is actually the conflict 
between what you're talking about, which is about <laughs> about encouraging um, culture and, and to kind of maintain that, and yet a priority above all else being going to housing. I, I, th I think from, again, coming back, I'm sorry to sound like a stuck record, the best um, advice that I was given um, was it was actually from um, Dame Tessa Jowell, who I saw about six weeks before the final hearing with the mayor. And she sat me down and said, you're going to lose because housing targets trump everything. And planners achieving those housing targets will put pressure on councillors to give it exactly the same situation that you have. So uh, uh, and I t from where, where I live, there's about a thousand houses going up in a greenfield site. And I'm, I'm watching how the, the, the group who are fighting that are going about it, and I don't think they're going about it the right way. The thing is, if you're trying to fight a development and trying to stop it happening, you will lose. You will lose against housing targets because there's a huge housing shortage in this country, and it, 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 it seems to try, it, it, we need homes, we need homes for people. Um, and the best way, we found of dealing with it was to try and find a way to let them build their houses but to build the protection in around you so if you need acoustic work done if you need soundproofing done on your venue if you need an easement like we managed to achieve around the local area that says okay well if you're going to build houses that are uh, you know a hundred yards from my front gate then we need some sort of recognition that we've operated in this way going on there. Please build that in and then we won't object to your application anymore. Make it easy for them to give you what, they, what you need to keep going rather than just trying to fight it and saying we, want, we object to this. It sounds easy, but it's not. It's exactly know, what we've tried to do. Apart from anything else, actually trying to keep our access road available. Um, and we've, you know, we've been waiting months and months and months and had no comment, no, you know, it's it's just not easy, and um, you know, I know every I know. Uh, sympathy with everybody that's, that's involved I, I wish, in it. I, I wish there was a, like, this easy <laughs> process that we could all, that, that we could all say, this is how it works, and this is how you follow by, and everyone will do what they're supposed to do, like everyone in each, from the <laughs> lawyers to the environmental health officers to the licensing authorities to the planners to counselors and all of that type of stuff, and that's just never the way it happens, and we can't fight housing, I agree. Housing is necessary, we need homes, but homes should not come at the expense of all the things around them that make them worth living in. And I think that that argument, and it's ridiculous that we even have to have it, but that argument is gaining traction, at least I can only speak from London, because that's uh, I've been. I think I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I, think, I think the conversation is now happening. The conversation is now happening. We need to have some policy in place, but I think, you know. But actually Anna, taking that conversation out of London is really important. Right it's really, but, and, and, and that's where it is, uh, uh, knowing what local authorities outside of London are like. They are 10 years behind where you guys are, and that is one of the issues. I think, I think if you, again, it, there are four pillars to this, and I'll, I'll almost certainly forget the fourth one, but there, there, there's a, a planning pillar, and you need to understand planning policy and how to fight that. There's a PR pillar, and fighting this in the press and in the media, and having the right campaigns and the right petitions and the right Facebook groups, that's all really important as well. There's a political aspect to it. Uh, so, you know, w working and lobbying local councillors um, and getting them on side and, and writing to your local MP or doorstepping your local MP is one. And I have forgotten the fourth one. What's the fourth one? There's, there is a technical aspect to it. So if you can win with evidential data, you know, but th that's not easy. And, but, you know, there are cheap acousticians around. Um, or good value ones, maybe that's the best way of describing it. I'm not his agent, by the way. Another question. I, I was just going to say, there is, there is some hope, but there are two, there's another aspect to this. The training for the planners and people who receive planning applications is inadequate in this area. And they have a 12 week turnaround for most of the planning applications. And those targets are really, really stiff. And there are penalties for missing them. So, having worked in local government and worked with planning colleagues, I would say actually put yourself into their heads because their training does not equip them in general, and there are honourable exceptions, with dealing with this part of the world. And they're the people that, you know, are the interface between the applicant and yourselves. 
And so you can do a lot by talking to them, getting them to understand. On a human level, some of them you know, are music lovers, yes. some of them are not. But the, how they have to wrestle with this, and then into putting that in the framework of dealing with elected members who have a whole bunch of other pressures, not the least um, around housing, social care, and all of those other things. So I understand that this is music that you trust, but I do think you need to try and also get into that. I, I think I think that's good, really good advice. I think, as as we've said. If you make this adversarial, um, it will become that. And you know, there are human beings on the other side of this. Generally, they're not property developers, but there are human beings uh, in local authorities. Um, but they're under a lot of pressure to achieve their targets as well. But I've got enormous sympathy. But you know, without wanting to put more burden on, on Mark and Bev, uh, Music Venues Trust have been close to all of this, and they've got a lot of expertise within that group, and, and, and you, you've been working on the emergency response. Yes, and, and the first thing is, it's local authority cuts, really, that are the crux of all this. So I have a friend who's a planner in Newham and a massive music fan. Uh, he's been helping us a lot. Uh, his workload has quadrupled since 2011. So he used to have 40 applications on his desk at any given time. Now he has between 160 and 200 applications. Um, and local, and so they just don't have the time and couple that with the expertise. That's true. And God, I feel terrible for them because they don't want to make a bad decision and they're not anti-culture. They're just, they're in the context in which they're in, but the emergency response actually, that, well that came from passing clouds. That, that was the idea of, be, of learning about a situation that had occurred without understand in my head understanding the whole history not of the venue but of the of all the things around the venue that we could learn about to help protect the venue as best we can nothing is perfect so we just wrote down every little thing that we could find out that we could try to find out about a venue and then went backwards and the idea is is if local government knows as much as possible about you and vice versa it's all about trying to mitigate potential challenges. I'll shut up. Sorry. Okay, just one thing for you for Milton Keynes. Um, it's worth having a look at a neighbourhood agreement. So prior to the application going in, go meet the developer, sit down, lay your cards on the table, tell them what you want, tell them they can pay for your sound surveys, and then you won't object to their planning. And then in, in part of that agreement, you can write in the things that Union Chapel lost so that any, any business that you might lose over the, over the build period, they'll compensate you for. There are ways of negotiating, and for them, having a, a sort of application that goes through smoothly with no objections is a lot better for them because it saves them a fortune. So have a look at neighbourhood agreements because they really do work. Well, most of them have got huge contingency lines in their budgets. Um, uh, and it is, you know, certainly from the perspective of ours, they put their planning application in in September 2009 and they expected to get it approved in November 2009. They didn't get an approval until uh, December 2013 and we estimated that uh, our objection was costing them £25,000 a quarter. So, I mean, it was running into millions of pounds worth of additional cost. Uh, well, it was costing us quite a lot of money as well, but by the time they got round to it, if they'd just come to the table with us and just said, what do you want? We could have worked that out and bashed it. We could have got to where we got to after four years if they'd been more uh, or less adversarial, uh, and potentially if we'd been less adversarial as well. But we just didn't know how to approach it and weren't getting the right advice. Um, let's. We've got five minutes left. Let's take one or two more questions. Depends how good the questions are. There's a question here. You've had your hand up quite a lot. Uh, yes, hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, introduce myself first of all. My name is Dale Ingram. I run a business called Planning for Pubs and we're in the business of protecting licensed premises. So I don't accept applications from developers who want to turn a pub into a shop or a house or knock it down and build a block of flats. Um, over the past three years, we have not lost a case. Every single one of the protection cases we've taken on has succeeded. So um, I want to take some issue with you, Lan. You said if you're up against the housing, you will lose. Um, and I can categorically tell you that that is not the case. Um, I, I think we are right. You were right earlier saying that uh, there is a hole 
um, in, in the planning legislation, in the National Planning Policy Framework and the London Plan, um, where music venues, live music venues, um, belong, and that is something that needs to be addressed. Um, the London Plan has been revised already twice. Uh, there were the early alterations and there were the further alterations to the London Plan. Um, I was part of the further alterations to the London Plan that gave additional protection um, to pubs. So um, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a further, further alterations to the London Plan um, to address that particular loophole for live music venues. Um, and that is something that I'll obviously be, t be taking up. Um, I'd just like to reiterate some of the other comments that some of the panel have made in being aware of what is going on in your local area, signing up for the planning alerts. You should be notified. Um, and as Lauren said, these uh, slightly anonymous letters land on your doormat and you think it's just some load of bump from the local council. Um, it isn't. You need to take action as soon as you receive them. Um, and there are people around who will help you. I am one of them. You will find me on the Gurus page. Um, and uh, I spend my entire life helping people like you, publicans, operators, local communities, fight the developer. And um, so far, touch wood, uh, with a 100% success rate. Um, and I'd be delighted to help any one of you in this room um, who has an issue. Well, I'm delighted to be wrong. Uh, one more question. I just had a quick question about practical advice you might have for mitigating any conflict that you've encountered with your new neighbours once, once the houses are up and the people are well, in. They're not in there yet. Um, <laughs> but maybe. I, I, uh, I, I, we, we've got a comprehensive plan. There are still developments going up around us. There was one that we, 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 we tried to object to and then lost on. But, you know, we... Um, uh, we try to make friends with them. We try to give concessionary entry and free entry to our new neighbours. We've done local events, uh, local events for local people, um, uh, and invite people down to the venue. And we try to be a good member of the community. I think before all of this happened, um, we were in our little bunker as well, and not really paying much attention to what was going on around us. But since then, and over the last six or seven years, uh, we've been much more proactive in helping the council out and running, allowing, letting the council use the venue for council events and letting uh, uh, you know, local community groups use the venue uh, gratis. Um, and just being a good member of the community, that does help because it garners support from you, uh, for you from uh, people who've got votes. And that makes a difference. Um, yeah, something I get all my venues to do is we have a sort of emergency hotline number for residents, which we say might not be answered because we'll be busy, but it means we have the opportunity to record those calls, find out what they were, what time they're on. When we're trading, the um, staff will take noise readings outside. There's some of the venues that are in sort of fairly densely student populated areas, so they'll note down in the venue diary, house party at such and such a number, you know, and then quite frequently, like the license review we had recently, one of the residents produced this diary of complaints against us. We produced our diary and said, well, actually, those five, we weren't even open, nothing to do with us. So be able to back yourself up and provide evidence. The residents feeling like they can vent when they need to, so doing tea and biscuit sessions every once in a while sometimes is painful, but good. Um, but yeah, just making sure that they know that they can complain, you'll listen, you're not going to take the blame for everything that goes on in the area because it's not always going to be your fault. I mean, we had a complaint because someone said they found a pool in their front garden. Uh, I, I've no idea how they managed to trace that back to us. Yeah, we had a complaint on Saturday morning from somebody who was two miles from the venue who said that they're clearly our customers because they're shouting as they walk past. Uh, I think we're about done, but um, thank you to all the panellists, thanks for your contribution. Well done Richard for taking it on the chin. Um, and uh, uh, please do uh, make use of the, the, the fantastic service that the Music Venues Trust provide in offering you immediate emergency assistance when you've got these issues. And also to Dale, was it, was it Dale? Um, who sounds like she has an amazing business that could be useful for all of us. Thank you.